some housekeeping tip, tips in regards to our presentation here. And let me go ahead and give you that full screen versus the side screen. Is that uh, you have the panel on the side, and I don't know why for some reason the picture isn't showing. <clears throat> Here we go. This webinar is being recorded, um, so we're asking that you please mute yourself, and I believe I muted both of you, both Jennifer and Kathy. Um, you can sign on whether you use your phone or your computer. If you have any questions, please take advantage and utilize this area here. There's a chat box, and you can type your question there, or you can raise your hand. Um, on the side, and then I will unmute you, and then you can go ahead and ask your questions specifically. Real quick about a little bit about us is you're calling the Washington Center for Women in Business. Uh, we are funded in co part through a cooperative agreement with the United States Small Business Administration. There are over 150 small business women centers throughout the nation. There are three here specifically in Washington State. Um, one in the Spokane area, one in Seattle, and then one here in Lacey. What we do as Women Business Centers is basically help women entrepreneurs, whether you're starting up a business, you need assistance in putting together a business plan or a marketing plan, you're looking for any type of legal uh, background or requirements, operations, etc. We're here to help you. In doing so, we provide one-on-one -on -one services uh, through coaching. We have individual coaches that can sit with you and walk uh, through different processes. We provide workshops or seminars such as this. We also provide a variety of multi-session trainings and online person um, or phone uh, coaching that's available. <clears throat> we do, as, as uh, with regards to the online coaching, uh, your first session is free, <clears throat> excuse me, but we offer a low cost up to $25 for a one hour session to be able to walk you through that process or provide you with guidance. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you were to need scholarships, you can contact me directly. And here's our current staff. We have myself, which is Eva, and I'm the program manager. I have Tom, who is one of our remote coaches, and then we also have Ryan um, for assistance in any coordinating our efforts. In addition to this particular webinar, we are having uh, four more that have been scheduled, one on women approaching retirement and beyond, uh, introduction to labor and industries for small businesses, five mistakes on business owners and how to avoid them, and then the upcoming, which is probably most important, is preparing for tax season. In that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Brennan, who is our speaker. And Brennan, I'm gonna go ahead and hand the slide card to you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, my name is Brennan, and uh, I've been with paid family and medical leave um, for about five months. Uh, so it has definitely been a um, big learning curve, a lot to go into this program, and uh, we are building it out in phases. So, um, yeah, just a lot to take in, um, but um, feel free to ask questions, and if you ask a question that I don't know, um, I will be happy to tell you that I don't know, and then I'll be happy to find the answer. So, um, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this uh, webinar will be kind of an overview, um, give you kind of the ins and outs and, and everything we kind of know up to this point. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. So, uh, paid family medical leave has been rolling out in phases. Um, this year, employers have had the responsibility to collect and remit premiums as well as uh, report hours and wages. Um, first and second quarter reporting was done in July and August, and then third quarter uh, is going on right now. And I just saw a message here. Uh, Kathy can't see the screen. Right. Let's see. Are you presenting? Sure. Yeah, I have shown my screen. Um, oh, she sees it now, she says. I think if there's just a oh, delay. You can see. If there's oh, a, a delay, delay, okay. Slide, so you may just want to wait as you're changing each slide. 
Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so third quarter reporting is going on uh, right now until the end of October. Um, again, first and second quarter reporting were done in July and August. Okay, and today uh, we'll start with the benefits of the program. Uh, even though employers are not required to administer the paid family medical, medical leave program uh, benefits, uh, we know that you're often the first resource when your employee needs to go on leave. So we want to give you an idea of how this benefit will work starting in January of 2020. So paid family medical leave is actually two different kinds of leave. There's family leave and medical leave. When we talk about family leave, this could be time to care for a qualifying family member. It could be the birth or placement of a child, uh, which is sometimes called parental leave in other programs. And this also includes military exigencies. So families of active uh, duty military members have time to prepare uh, before their loved one is called to serve. Uh, they could also spend time to recuperate when they come back on um, some sort of R&R leave or when they come back from their deployment. Uh, medical leave, on the other hand, is when we have a need for leave to care for ourselves. So this is when you experience a serious health condition. In other states, this is sometimes called short-term disability or temporary disability. Uh, so now we'll talk about the qualifying events. Um, as I said, medical leave is paid leave from work to care for yourself when you've experienced a serious health condition. So. Medical leave covers events like recovering from back surgery, uh, could be recuperating after a terrible auto accident, uh, or being treated with chemotherapy after a cancer diagnosis. And it's important to remember that an employer is not responsible for validating these medical conditions. The worker is responsible for applying for benefits directly with the department, and they are also responsible for getting necessary medical validations uh, which they have signed by a qualified medical professional and then the employee returns that directly to our department so these are not the employer's responsibilities and you'll probably hear me say that uh, quite a few times today so family leave includes bonding time after the birth or placement of a child so that does include adoption and foster placement and it's bonding time is special in that you have the first year after the birth or placement of the child to use the available leave. And this is available to both parents. And, and one thing we definitely get asked a lot of questions about when we're talking about bonding time is that babies that are born in 2019 uh, are eligible, their, their parents are eligible uh, for leave in 2020. They would have up until the child's first birthday to use uh, that bonding leave. And family leave is also available when a family member experiences a serious health condition. So this con uh, condition, again, is verified by a medical professional and managing this process is not the employer's responsibility uh, when it comes to paid family leave, it's on the employee. And you can see that the definition uh, for paid family and medical leave, uh, as far as family is concerned, is very similar to FMLA's definition, but it is a little bit broader. Uh, on the left side of the screen, you can see that uh, paid family medical leave defines uh, a definition includes grandchildren, uh, grandparents, children, in-laws, and step relationships. On the right side of the slide, you'll see that aunts, uncles, cousins, roommates, and distant relatives are not covered. At the bottom, you may see pets. Even though we do think of our pets as being part of the family, uh, they are not included in paid family and medical leave. And I mentioned it earlier, uh, but there's uh, a section for paid family medical leave as it relates to military exigencies. A military exigency broadly relates to deployment and the preparation before and recovery time after uh, an employment deployment has occurred. Uh, the family of the person being deployed could ut utilize paid family medical leave to spend time before deployment or when the person is back on leave. And it's important to note that the person being deployed is a federal employee and may not qualify to use paid family medical leave if they do not have additional employment outside of their federal uh, employment. So 
So when I was talking about uh, family leave and uh, medical leave, I mentioned a serious health condition. Uh, the definition of a serious health condition is important and it can be found in our statute. Uh, I won't go into details today because validating a medical condition is not the employer's responsibility. Uh, that being said, I do want to give you an idea of what is included and what isn't. Uh, generally, this is going to include chronic serious health conditions. Uh, this could be mental health conditions, substance abuse treatments, and more. Uh, generally, it is not going to include the common cold, flu, ear aches, upset stomach, minor ulcers, headaches, other than migraines, cosmetic treatments, and other uh, types of non-serious uh, health conditions as defined by our statute. Uh, these conditions do need to be validated by a doctor, and again, they are then submitted by the employee to the department. And again, to reiterate, completing this paperwork is the employee's responsibility, not the employer's. Okay. So, family leave and medical leave, well, we've gone over the two different kinds of leave. Uh, now we'll talk about um, the eligibility requirements. In order for a worker to be eligible for paid family and medical leave, they must work 820 hours in the qualifying period. The qualifying period is a year of time, so they must work 820 hours in that year. Now, technically, the qualifying period, period is either the first four of the last five completed calendar quarters or the last four completed calendar quarters if the worker doesn't qualify in that initial period. Verifying a worker's eligibility is the responsibility of the department, not the employer. Uh, we're gonna base this on the quarterly reports that the employer uh, submit. And also it's important to note that these 820 hours could come from more than one employer. If a worker worked 10 hours a week at a coffee shop and 10 hours a week at a grocery store, uh, they would earn 20 hours a week toward the eligibility. Now, if you do the math, 820 hours divided by 52 weeks in a year, a worker would have to work a little bit over 15 hours a week on average in a qualifying period to qualify. And you can see there also that if you work 20 hours a week, you'll hit 820 hours in about 41 weeks and then 40 hours a week you'll get there in about 20 and a half weeks. But again, the main things here are to remember that 820 hours could come from multiple uh, employers. So um, we'll often get asked if I have an employer, uh, sorry, employee uh, who's never going to work uh, 820 hours for me uh, in that qualifying period. Uh, the key thing to remember is that they could have a job elsewhere that could all add up uh, to getting them to their 820 hour uh, qualifying number. Okay, so we've talked about family leave, uh, and now we'll talk about uh, what those weeks of leave uh, or time available uh, looks like. The amount of leave available to a, a worker will generally be uh, that top line there. It'll be uh, 12 typical work weeks. If a worker experiences both family and medical leave events in a single year, they could have access to 16 typical work weeks of leave. And the statute also adds two additional typical work weeks when a worker experiences complications uh, related to a pregnancy. So if you experience a serious health condition and you need to take uh, medical leave to care for yourself, uh, you would have up to 12 weeks of leave available. Um, if you have a family member um, that needs uh, care after a serious health condition, you would have 12 weeks of family leave. So it's 12 weeks of each. Um, if you were to experience both in the same year, you get that 16 weeks and then again, additional two weeks um, related to complications from a pregnancy. So um, before the birth of a child, if uh, bed rest is, is ordered by the doctor, that sort of thing. And also a key thing to remember is those are up to 12 weeks. If the doctor certifies you to be off work for four weeks, then your leave would be four weeks. Um, you don't have to use all 12 weeks and again, it's going to require a doctor certifying how much time you do need. Two more important notes about leave duration. The minimum claim duration is eight hours, so you can't use paid family and medical leave if you intend to take less time than those eight hours. And there's also a week-long waiting period in statute, and that applies to um, 
all leave except for when an event such as birth or placement of a child, there is no waiting week uh, in those events. And so when a worker qualifies for leave, they will receive a proportion of their normal weekly wage. This will range from $100 to uh, $1,000 per week. And for most people, it's going to be about 70% of the average worker's typical weekly wage. Those who make less than half of the state average weekly wage will get 90% of their typical weekly wage. So it's on a sliding scale. So um, I believe it's 65,000 uh, around there is the uh, typical annual salary. So workers that make less than half of that would get up to 90%. So um, if you look at the chart there, if you make $500, uh, that would be about 450. And then the percentage gets smaller. Um, the more you make. So we do cap it at $1,000 um, per week. Uh, again, most people are going to fall into that 60, 70% of their average uh, typical weekly wage. And we are working, we are working on an online benefit calculator. Uh, so look for that before, hopefully before the end of the year. Um, and employers paying supplemental benefits. Um, this was kind of a, a new concept that came out in rule uh, making during the fifth phase. Um, so an employer could choose to offer supplemental benefits to their employee while they're on leave. So if an employee is making 70% of their typical weekly wage, um, the employer could offer paid time off, uh, PTO time uh, as a supplemental benefit to make up that 30%. So uh, more rules around that are continuing into phase six, which will go from um, right now until the end of the year. So stay tuned for more on that. And so we talked about the details about qualifying for leave and how the benefits works. I uh, want to give you a, a little bit of an insight into what the leave cycle will look like. The first two important things for an employee taking leave are, again, they must work 820 hours and have a qualifying family or medical leave event. Now, if the event is foreseeable, the employee must give their employer 30 days notice before they intend to take leave. When it's not foreseeable, the employee may still be eligible for leave and can file their claim after the event has occurred. So um, if the employee has a foreseeable event and does not give their employee uh, employer uh, 30 days notification, uh, their leave could be delayed until that 30 day uh, notice has been met. So assuming they've worked 820 hours, they have a qualifying event, uh, the employee can then file a claim and they'll do that directly with our department. And our department is responsible for validating the qualifying event and confirming the employee has worked those 820 hours. So again, that's where the reports that are submitted quarterly comes into play. Uh, we'll use those to establish the uh, 820 hour eligibility. Uh, and then again, we'll use a doctor's note um, and certification for the validating the medical um, need. An employer will receive notification from the department uh, when an application for leave has been submitted to our department. So that will be communicated to the uh, employer from the department. And once the claim has been approved, the department will issue payment directly to the worker. The worker will have to file regular updates to the department verifying that they are still on leave. So uh, this will be a weekly or bi-weekly um, process and they'll submit it uh, to the department and say if anything has changed, they will also indicate um, you can use paid family medical leave intermittently. So if they worked Monday and Tuesday and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they use paid family medical leave, uh, those will have to be indicated as well. And when the leave is complete, the worker may return to work. Uh, job protection or employment restoration is available and it's similar to uh, those rules that are uh, for FMLA. So an employee's job is protected when the worker has worked for an employer with 50 or more employees, has worked for that employer for at, last, uh, for at least a year, and has worked 1,250 hours for that employer. 
when a worker qualifies for job protection, they must be given the same or equivalent position when they return from leave. All right, now let's talk about the employer's responsibilities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, starting with the first paycheck in 2019, employers should be collecting premiums. And then in July and August, that was the first and second quarter reports. Third quarter reporting is going on uh, right now. And then employers will have to notify their employees uh, about paid family medical leave, and you'll do that uh, in the form of a poster, which we'll have uh, supplied by the end of the year. And also, if an employee were to go on a leave uh, that might qualify for paid family medical leave, the employer must notify that employee uh, within seven days of that employee being on leave. So there is that notification there as well. Okay. So, kind of give you a refresher, uh, re employers are responsible for collecting premiums for paid family and medical leave. An employer can choose to pay the entire premium on their own, or they can collect up to 63.33% of the total premium from their employees. And this premium is assessed on the gross wages, and we'll talk more about gross wages now. Uh, gross wages include, but are not li in limited to salary or hourly wages, sick leave, vacation leave, holiday pay, bereavement leave, and paid time off, uh, bonuses, stocks as part of a compensation package, and the cash value of meals and lodging when given as compensation. So a uh, list there of what's not included, um, I'm sorry, what is included, um, things like reimbursements are not wages and wouldn't be included in gross wages. And you may be familiar with uh, Washington State's unemployment insurance program and the exceptions in that program, like corporate officers. It's important to understand that the exceptions from unemployment insurance do not apply to our program. So you may have some employees uh, who would be included in paid family and medical leave, but they're not included in unemployment insurance. And premiums are capped at the Social Security wage base or the Social Security cap, which the Social Security Administration set $132,900 in 2019. At that point, employers are no longer assessed the premiums uh, and withholding from their paycheck stops. It's important to note that employees that who go over that cap should continue to be on your quarterly reports. And we know compensation can sometimes be complicated, so if you have any more questions about gross wages, uh, please call or write our customer care team and we'll have that contact information for you uh, at the end of the presentation. And you may be familiar with uh, premiums and how they're calculated, but I do want to offer a quick refresher. Uh, so our state divides the total premium into family and medical portions, then further divides those portions into employer and employee portions. This can seem complicated, so we've reduced it down to the two steps you see on the slide. Um, you would take the Total premium, uh, you get that number by multiplying the gross wages by 0 .004, and then you take that total premium number and multiply it by 0 .3667, and that's the employer portion. Uh, you take that total premium times 0 .6333, and that's how you get the employee portion. And it's important to note that if you have fewer than 50 employees, you do not have to pay the employer portion. For these small employers, their portion of the premium goes away. It's not transferred to the employees or anyone else. Uh, these businesses are simply not assessed the employer portion of the premium. They are only assessed the employee's portion. Now, if you haven't withheld premiums from employees up to now, you can begin at any time as long as you give your employees one pay period of notice before the change. And as an employer, you cannot collect missed premiums in later pay periods, and the employer is responsible for paying any missed premiums as well. And so I mentioned how businesses with fewer than 50 employees don't have to pay the employer portion of the premium. Uh, business size, as it relates to calculating premiums, is done once a year. 
now in a typical year the department will look at reporting done throughout the year and then on september thirtieth we will then average the number of employees over those four quarters so in the example on the slide uh, you can see this business averaged sixty employees throughout the year so for paid family and medical leave this business has sixty employees next year the average will be recalculated and this business may have more or less employees at that point so business size changes only once a year and it's at the beginning of the year now it's important to know that this is a headcount we report both part-time and full-time employees and we are not using full-time equivalent or any other method of counting employees in paid family and medical leave again this is strictly a headcount now 2019 is a special case when it comes to calculating business size. Since this will be the first year of reporting, we have used the first quarter to re, uh, report to determine business size for 2019. Next year, we will recalculate using the first and second quarter reports uh, in 2019 uh, for 2020 business size. And this will be the only time that we do it this way. All right, now let's talk about reporting. Uh, reporting for paid family and medical leave um, again is going on right now for the third quarter uh, i just want to do a quick overview of what the process looks like and what to report and how to submit your report to the department uh, if you're having trouble or have had trouble reporting uh, we would be happy to help you uh, give our customer care team a call or an email again i'll have that information uh, at the end of the slide presentation uh, for you to jot down so reporting for paid family medical leave is done through Secure Access Washington, also known as SAW. And you navigate to SAW and click Add a Service, and then you will find paid family and medical leave. It's listed under the Employment Security Department. Once you've added this service to your account, you will see it on your SAW dashboard. You then click the paid family and medical leave link that's on your SAW dashboard, and that's going to pass you into the paid family and medical leave portal where you will be asked to create an account you will need your business's UBI number, uh, the business name, and contact information. So um, you must have all that information to register a new account. There are two different kinds of accounts, employers and employer agents. Uh, employer agents should only create an employer agent account for themselves if they have employees in Washington and should not create an employer account for their clients. So employer agents are third party administrators that, that report on behalf of, of many businesses. Uh, we will need to verify your information when you do create an employer account and we will do this by sending a PIN to the address we have on file. The system will generate a PIN and send it to you uh, within three to five business days by postal mail. You will however have limited access immediately uh, when you create your account and you can file an reports and make payments uh, before you complete the PIN process. Uh, again, you won't need to complete the verification process, um, the PIN process before you can submit a report and make payments. It is still important to complete that process though. So when you do um, receive your PIN, go ahead and verify your account. You will then have full access and then you can have access to delegate um, additional users, see past reports, and, and a few other nice features. So again, verifying your account and getting a full access is important. And this slide just kind of gives you a, a breakdown of what they're asking uh, employers to report. These include wages and hours in the quarter uh, and other identifying information about your employees. Wages and hours are reported in the quarter they are paid, and this can sometimes be confusing if you have a pay period that includes the end of one quarter and the beginning of the next, and the easiest way to know which quarter to report them is to simply use the pay date. If the wages are paid in the second quarter, you report them in the second quarter along with the associated hours. And please note that paid family medical leave reports are similar to unemployment reports, but they are an additional report that is filed separately. And so the paid family medical leave report does not replace uh, your unemployment report. And there are three ways to submit a report. You can manually enter uh, the information and this is available to employers with fewer than 50 employees. Uh, the second and likely the most common method is uploading a CSV file 
this is a spreadsheet in the specified format that has the employee's information and then you upload that uh, as one file and you can find a template on our website and then employer agents uh, are able to file uh, in using an ICESTA file format which is just a bulk filing option um, again that's available to employer agents if you report for more than one UBI, but you are not an employer agent, you will use the single filing option, and then you will create a different CSV spreadsheet for each UBI, and then upload it to that uh, business's account. And you can find out more about the reporting options on our reporting page. Um, that's paidleave.wa.gov slash reporting. And if you find that you've made an error in your report and you need to fix it, you will submit an amendment to submit an amendment, uh, you would upload your, your report again with the corrections that you need to make. Your amended report will then replace all the data that we have for that UBI. So you can't simply add a single employee or change one employee's hours. You must resubmit the entire UBI's information with the corrections, additions, uh, or subtractions. And remember that reporting is done by UBI. This could be an issue if you have more than one person reporting for the same UBI. Uh, employers will need to coordinate reporting for a single UBI so that a second report that was meant to add information doesn't amend uh, or, in other words, replace a previously submitted report. And all data for a single UBI should be submitted in a single fire, uh, file. An error report is available on the wage submission history page. Uh, under the wage reporting tab. And if something doesn't go as you expect, uh, when you submit your wage report, the re error report is a good place to check for those issues. And this just kind of gives you a breakdown. The schedule for reporting and remitting is the same as unemployment insurance, except for the first and second quarter of this year, which was done in July and August. Third quarter reporting is being done now until the end of the month. And so you can see that you have the month following the end of the quarter to submit your report for the previous quarter. And as I mentioned, uh, there are a few notification requirements. The first requirement is a workplace poster. Uh, the department is going to be developing this poster, not the employers. Uh, so we'll be developing this poster and you'll find it on paidleave.wa.gov. That'll be later this year. And again, employers will also be required to notify their employees of paid family and medical leave when they are on leave for reasons that could be covered by the program. And we'll have more details about that uh, before the end of the year as well. So we have more webinars uh, scheduled now and throughout the year. So if you or someone else needs to hear and, and know this information, that's a great place to start. Um, Check out the employer toolkit, um, paidleave.wa.gov slash employers there on the screen. A lot of great information on that site, uh, on that page. You can also download a pay stub insert and you could put that into your employees' uh, paychecks just to let them know about this program. Again, uh, that's on the employer section and we have ongoing rulemaking and you can participate. Uh, and you can see that website there and you can find out what's going on in the current phases of rulemaking and also what has been considered in previous phases of rulemaking. And this is our contact information. Uh, this goes directly to our customer care team. Uh, wonderful people that we have on our customer care team ready to help you out. So if you do run into any issues uh, or questions, um, give, them, give them a ring, give them an email. Uh, they will be happy to help you, but with that, uh, we have about 20 minutes, and I would be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> yeah, so Kathy or Jennifer, did you ladies have any questions? I guess what I can just do is unmute the both of you so you have the option to go ahead and just speak. So Kathy, as you raised your hand, but I unmuted you. Do you have the option to speak freely? Okay, uh, now I'm free. Free. I guess I muted myself as well. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Okay. Um, 
I, I think that you said, thank you for the presentation. It was very clear. Uh, it's a lot, I, and I have already successfully filed, you know, the first and second quarter. So I've, I'm through a lot of those steps. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we're an LLC, LLC uh, company, and our uh, the owners were chose to waive on this. Is that not is something that we can do? I think that's the way we've been doing it. Um, not the the two members of the LLC. Okay, yeah. So, um, well, first of all, I'm glad the reporting uh, went well. Um, and so you said an LLC, uh, member owners in an LLC do not have to participate uh, in paid family medical leave. Um, you know, their employees, if they have employees, um, you know, they would need to submit reports uh, and, you know, collect premiums. Um, but member owners of an LLC can choose to opt in. Um, and that is actually available now. Um, when you go to That's your good. SAW. No, they oh, actually yeah, wanted, yeah. They did not want to participate. So, so the standard is that, yeah. they're, that they're considered not, not in. That's good. Yep, that's correct. That's, yep, that's, that's correct. Okay. Um, let's see. And the poster is, is going to be developed still. Uh, I, I, I made, you know, some signals for myself. Staff is. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Um, oh, you talked about a, the cap, earning cap on uh, for paying premiums. As, I think it was 132000 was the same as the Social Security thing. Um, yep, and that, yep, that's it. that you still report the hours or, or tell me about that again that went by fast for me okay yeah no problem so um, yeah we, we have the cap at 132,900 so that's for 2019 um, that could change um, for next year but for 2019 that is the cap um, so the the point four percent that's being assessed uh, stops at that point um, so if they make you know more than that cap, uh, it's only the premiums only being collected on the 132,000. So um, you just if they make 200,000 a year, it's not being assessed on the full 200. It's on the 132,000. Uh, but then when you do your reporting, they are still um, being reported on your quarterly reports. So what's being reported is all of that, and then the system will automatically not. Uh, claim the premium, or, or do they just yeah. do we just turn in the hours? I mean, it, it, does the reporting on someone who is earning more than that um, stay the same for me in any in every way? Yeah, it's um, you know that's a, that's actually a good automated. question. Yeah, so if if the system is is calculating based on the, the 132,000 uh, or anything over that, um, I'm not actually sure if the system is um, automatically cutting off at 132,000 or if you would just report the 132,900. Um, that is actually a good question. I would have to ask a, a member of the customer care team exactly how that worked. Um, so what I can do is I can take the question over to the customer care team and then uh, I can send these slides uh, and also uh, to Eva, and then I can also answer that question. So if that works for you, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that because I'm not entirely sure if, if the system is is capping that or not. So good question. Okay, and so so right now we don't know if I would do anything different. Um, uh, yeah, because yeah, and, and yeah. I and and the you know the system does calculate the premium. You know, even though we've we've also so far, we've balanced, right? <laughs> what we've taken out yep. has been what has been calculated, you know, like, you know, sure. For each check. So that's that's been working just fine. We're with okay, ADP yeah, so, now, so um, it's that's oh, okay. our payroll service. So. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if if it's been working, then I I imagine that the system is doing as as it should. But I I do want to just follow up and just make sure that uh, I'm I'm spreading accurate information there. Yeah. Well. Thank you. Um, so you'll you'll get back to me. You have my contact information from signing up for this class. Yeah. Uh, I'll right? send it to I'll send it to Eva, and then she can send it to everyone that's attended. Great. Okay. So I I had another question that just came up, and and now it it's evaporated. Let me just backtrack. Um, 
So actually, this is the first, oh, that's right. It's about um, agents. Um, this is the first quarter uh, that, that we just completed that ADP is my, our, uh, our um, payroll provider. And our previous one, of course, couldn't submit any reports because the system wasn't set up for them to be set up to be submitted until July 1st, which is when they stopped working for us. <laughs> so, okay, so I gotcha. I turned in the reports, you know. So right now I'm doing it manually, and I probably will this quarter too until things kind of settle down. Um, and then you did start to talk, but you did mention the the agent um, the agent has to have their, a separate saw account. Now, yes, would correct. They have so a, the Okay. The agent would, so ADP would already have a SAW account probably if they are turning in our, all of our other taxes, right? Our, our labor and industry uh, or L&I or, or and, uh, unemployment. Yeah, if they're, if they're doing your reporting, uh, they would still have to add it as a, a service, but they would have an employer agent account. Um, so what this means is that they wouldn't be going in and creating an account as you which i guess you've already if you've already reported for the first and second quarter as yourself um so the employer agent again would not be going in and creating an account as the employer uh, they would cr create an employer agent account which um the the system you're using um we we've had plenty of experience with them um but they would go in and then what they can do is uh, link to your account that you've already created and submit a report that way. Um, they would have the options to report, you know, the single filing, the manual entry or the bulk filing. So they could submit one report in that bulk filing and then that, that reports from multiple UBIs in one file. So it would just depend on how, um, how they're doing it but oh. yes yeah, so they would create their own employer agent account and then they would potentially link to your account to file those reports rather than going in and creating an account as the right. employer if that right. makes sense it does make sense and, I, and and i'm thinking that they already have some kind of saw account or uh, access to for us or else they wouldn't be submitting the payroll reports already all right you know the taxes and and everything for yeah us. Yeah, they, they might, um, you know, if, and I'm not sure exactly. I mean, you know, agent, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they, they would probably, you know, um, I'm, I'm not okay, sure how how they're exactly set up. But, yeah, yeah, I would definitely make sure, you know, if you're plan on uh, submitting the, the third quarter report, you know, like we always advise just to kind of, uh, you know, make sure that they're aware that they need to report or if you're going to if you're going to do the third quarter then you know that that you're going to report that and they don't have to so that way uh you know duplicate reports and that sort of thing don't get submitted right right okay um all right let's see if there's any other questions i had uh yeah i i think that's it for this for on this venue i your customer service people have been but for as much as they've known with everything being formed while they're having to use it, kind of driving down the freeway with the hood up. Um, that's what you guys have been having to do. Uh, sure, yeah. Things. Building the plane as we fly it is what I hear a lot. So, yeah, uh, I, that's yeah. how it's been. It's been really interesting to watch it. So, okay. Uh, thank, well, thank you. Thank you very much. You I'll be sure to pass it on to them. Okay. You're very welcome. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jennifer, did you have any questions that you wanted to add before we ended the conversation? No, I don't have any questions for today. Okay. All right. Well, thank you both, uh, Jennifer and Kathy. I really appreciate it. And extra kudos to Brennan for uh, providing this information. Um, as part of the materials on the right-hand side of the panel, if you see that, um, you can download the two presentations, whether it's just my quick intro or the, uh, the presentation that Brennan uh, presented. But I will also follow up and provide copies of the slide to everyone who attended. And I will provide him with um, your contact information so he can follow up on that question, Kathy. <clears throat> Brennan, did you have anything else that you wanted to quickly add before we end the, the call? No. Uh, no, the, just that I'll uh, I'll get that answer uh, sent out today. 
um, and follow up. But I really appreciate uh, the time to present. And, uh, you know, again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the customer care team or sign up for another uh, webinar as we get closer to uh, the end of the year. A lot more information is going to be coming out, um, you know, around the benefits part of the program. So, um, you know, again, that phase phasing in uh, process that building the plane as you fly it uh, so you know we're kind of all in this together so I would just say stay tuned uh, as we get closer to January 1st thank you yes no thank you thank you everybody and hope everybody has a lovely afternoon talk to you later bye-bye